Welcome to our Managing Through Crisis Summer Series presented by Michigan State University's Broad College of Business. My name is Marcy Stoll, one of the Assistant Directors of Executive Development at MSU. Today we are sharing some very interesting current research on consumer behavior mid-crises. Dr. Forrest Morgison will present his research for the first 30 minutes of this webinar, after which I will share your questions with him. So please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit your questions throughout the presentation, and I will share as many of those as I can, as time allows, with Dr. Morgison. And as always, after we conclude, we will provide you through a link, a link to a recording of the webinar, which is posted on the Broad College YouTube channel, along with all the other webinars we've done as part of this series. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. David Freyer, the Assistant Dean of Outreach and Engagement for the Bro College of Business. Dr. Freyer, thank you for being with us today again and for supporting well, this Thank series. you, Marcy. It's a great pleasure to be here and thank you for all the great support and, and planning that you've done uh, to support and develop this program. It's been a, a fantastic journey uh, this summer. Um, on behalf of uh, Dean Gupta and our entire Bro College team, I do want to welcome everyone. Uh, to the latest installment in the uh, Managing Crisis Summer Series. Uh, very excited to have all of you with us today. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for the day, I did want to just mention um, that we continue to appreciate your feedback and the thoughts that you're providing us uh, concerning how you can continue to engage uh, with the Broad College through topics like the ones we're covering here in the Summer Series. As we've mentioned and, and as we've begun sharing with all of you, uh, we obviously have a portfolio of programs through executive development programs uh, that cover many of the topics and, and issues that we've been discussing, and we welcome you to explore those. Uh, we also have a uh, Business and Bagels uh, series of short one-hour webinars that we've begun introducing to you as well. Our next session is next week, uh, speaking on the topic of uh, social media uh, and how to get impact from social media. Uh, we are working on LinkedIn to try and connect all of you to us through LinkedIn opportunities. And I had one new one uh, to mention to all of you today. Uh, the Broad College for many, many years has offered a Detroit Executive Forum. It's typically an evening session uh, held uh, down in the Detroit area. Uh, this year, it will be 100% virtual. Uh, it's scheduled for Monday, September 21st. Uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, it is, as I said, via Zoom webinar. Uh, there is no cost. Registration is free for the event. And the focus is going to be on navigating the new normal with artificial intelligence. Uh, Manoj Saxena, who is a Spartan alum and executive chairman of Cognitive Scale, uh, is going to be interviewed by uh, Dean Gupta. And, and I think you'll find it be a fascinating presentation. Uh, about an area of rapid development and something that uh, we hope you all will find valuable. We thought that might be of interest to many of you who've been enjoying the summer series. We will send a link in a post-webinar email uh, to allow you to uh, sign up and register for that event, uh, but uh, hopefully you'll find that valuable. As we continue developing additional opportunities, we will be sure to share these with you. With that in mind, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Forrest Morgison to, uh, to our session today. Uh, Forrest is a great colleague and a great friend. He has been doing amazing work uh, in the area of consumer behavior, uh, customer experience management, all sorts of fantastic topics. He's an active participant in many of our executive education programs. And we're kind of excited today because he's going to share a little bit of research data uh, and insight with you on consumer behavior uh, during this crisis. And so with that, Forrest, thank you so much for being here. We're excited uh, to have you with us and look forward to hearing what you have to share with us this afternoon. Great. It's great to be here. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, as David said, I am Forrest Morgison. I'm a member of the Department of Marketing here at Michigan State University. Um, I am mostly in, engaged in research looking at what consumers do and why consumers do what they do. Uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, through this lecture is some data that we started collecting. And when I say we, I mean myself and a couple other researchers at Michigan State. Um, some data that we started collecting 
in late April and early May. And, and essentially what we did was say, okay, with everything that's going on, what can we expect the, the implications to be for consumers and their behaviors? Um, and our goal was always, including back in early April, May, to, to do that first round of data. And we crafted a, a consumer survey where we put together what we thought were uh, a cohort of relevant questions that would be important to understand about consumers, to try to understand their attitudes and, and ultimately how that's going to translate into behaviors. Um, we intended then to re-measure these same consumers in the future. And so this is what we what we academics call a panel study. We're, we're measuring the exact same group of consumers. Um, and we did that again in late August and early September. So the data that you're looking at here is um, really very fresh. And I'm just gonna go through a few of the highlights. I'm not gonna get deep into statistical analysis of the data. Um, it's ultimately our goal to, uh, we've already written one um, um, short article about this data back in May from the first set of results. And we're ultimately planning on turning this into a more robust research project um, where we really dig into the data. But what I'm gonna present to you now are just some key takeaways from this and some early interpretations of these results and, and their implications for consumer behavior now. And by now, I mean literally right now, but in the short term, but also the longer term as this, this really unique set of circumstances unfolds out into the future. And so with that, let me get right into to the data and, and what we're looking at here. The first thing that we wanted to know was how have consumers' situations changed? The big, you know, starting back in mid-March of this year, the big change that impacted virtually all American consumers were the stay-at-home orders, the shelter-in-place orders, the um, safer-at-home orders. So one of the first questions we asked in this survey when we first did it back in late April and early May um, was what, what percentage of you are under some kind of stay at home order and we found that at that time the the group of respondents were almost entirely under stay at home orders it was 95 percent that were sheltered in place uh, quarantined whatever you want to call it under some kind of governmental order we found that that number dropped to just over 50% by September when we interviewed the same group of customers, of consumers. So it had almost been cut in half. And this really translated into the changed working environment between May and September. So in May, we found that 78% of the respondents said that they were working from home and another 12% said that they were working both from inside and outside the home. So 90% um, and only 10% were working outside the home. By September, this situation had eased up substantially as, as freedom of movement was quote unquote reinstated. Um, and more and more governments decided to open up mostly for the benefit of economies and, and the job market, of course. Um, and so by September, um, only 57% said they were working only from home. That's still a huge number, but it's much less than it was in May. Um, and the number that had said that they were working either inside and outside the home or just outside the home doubled between May and September. So you can see here that we're getting more movement again. And of course, as consumers are able to move more, um, their behaviors are going to change a little bit. And you'll see some of the, the results of that in what follows. We also wanted to get an idea as very much a relevant factor in how consumers behave um, about how this, this group of consumers was feeling both in May and in September. Um, I titled this Fear Declining um, because what we really found was that in May we saw really high levels when we asked them on, on, on a scaled variable. Um, I took the percentages here that said that they were quite a bit or extremely anxious, stressed, powerless, and scared. In May, we saw that 33% said that they were quite a bit or extremely anxious. 35% um, said that for stress. 31% said that for powerless. 32% said that for scared. Almost all of those numbers have been cut in half or more since May. We see that by September, those numbers are down substantially. Um, we see that in, for anxiety, it's down to 17% in September, 18% for stress, 22% for powerless, more than cut in half for scared to 15%. 
So ultimately what we're seeing is that consumers are feeling less anxiety, stress, powerlessness, and so forth. Um, and that's important for consumer behavior because of course what we find is that when consumers are feeling less confident, less optimistic, um, less at ease, they tend to be more conservative in how they spend. I'll go over the impact that that's had on the economy in a little bit and it's been tremendous. Um, but of course, as these feelings subside a little bit, we should expect consumers to, to return a little bit more to their uh, pre-pandemic behaviors. It is important to note here, while I say fear is declining, there's still substantial fear out there in the consumer population. We asked um, the percentages, or I calculated the percentages of the respondents between May and September that said that they were somewhat or very afraid to die of COVID-19. In May, that number was 53%. It's down in September, but only to 47%. So there's a lot of fear still out there in the American consumer population. They, they still very much have fear of this virus, and that's going to have implications for what they're doing as consumers. Um, I'll show um, in a little bit some, some results from what they're spending more and less on during the pandemic, and it's really stark. The things that they're spending less on are very much detached to fear of this situation, fear of the, the coronavirus and the pandemic and so forth. So there's still a lot of fear out there, even though things have normalized a little bit since um, April and May. Some other numbers that we found that I think are really important to understand about the implications of this for consumer behavior is that the employment picture has changed um, substantially. In May, we found, and, and just let me pause here for a moment and say these are results from our survey and asking these customers. So these numbers don't perfectly align with the government estimates, but they're actually quite close to those um, officially released government estimates about unemployment. Uh, but in May, we found that 16.3% of the respondents said that they were currently unemployed, furloughed, or laid off from work. Um, due, to the, due to the pandemic. Um, by the August-September wave of the survey, that number is down to 10.2%. The official government estimates just under 9% right now. So the numbers are, are quite similar. So we can sort of confirm that things are getting back to normal to some extent in the employment picture. Of course, 10% or 9% unemployment is still really, really high and much higher than long-term trends, uh, but there's some return to normalization in the employment picture. Similar with income, when we asked respondents um, to say if their income had decreased somewhat or considerably on a scale variable, in May, 42% of the respondents said that their income had decreased somewhat or considerably, a huge number, and that number was down to 27% in September. And so the conclusion here is that the unemployment picture is better and incomes have stabilized to some extent, though many consumers are still making less than they did before the pandemic. Obviously, if consumers don't have dollars to spend, um, it's really difficult for the economy to grow. Consumer spending makes up about 70% of economic activity in the United States. And so without those dollars flowing into consumers' hands through the labor market, it's really difficult to have robust economic growth. Um, and so we still need to, to remember that, that it's better, things are better now, but they're still far from normal in terms of the employment picture or the income of consumers and how much they're making. One of the, the sort of enduring stories and, and important stories, I think, is during the pandemic is, is, is it going to change consumer habits and behaviors over the long term? Um, we asked what percentage of these customers were shopping somewhat or much more online than they did before the pandemic began in May. In May, it was 51%. More than half of the respondents said that they were shopping somewhat or much more online than they had before. By the latest wave, that number had dropped to 37%. And so to some extent, you see a little bit of a return um, to normal in terms of shopping behavior. In other words, it may not be the case, excuse me, <clears throat> it may not be the case that consumers transition entirely to online and, and the e-retail environment, but they're looking forward to getting back out into the malls, getting back out into brick and mortar retail outlets where they can, uh, behave a little bit more normally and as they did before the pandemic. Still, more than a third of respondents say that they're shopping somewhat or 
much more online than they did before the pandemic. Obviously, there's already been significant implications for a variety of brick and mortar retailers um, because of the pandemic. Several of them have gone into bankruptcy, of course, and these are big stories. Um, and it's difficult to forecast, um, but to some extent, it's hard to see that, that the same picture will exist in terms of the variety of options we have as consumers in brick and mortar retailers once the pandemic is over, simply because many of them um, have gone and more will go out of business. Um, you can really see the, the impact of this. Um, this is a comparison between the stock market performance of Amazon and the S&P 500, which is the lighter blue line at the bottom. Obviously, um, the pandemic has been tragic at a human level, and for much of the economy, it's been tragic as well. But a few companies, one of them being Amazon, have really thrived during the pandemic. And so this change in buying behaviors, to some extent, is taking resources out of the pool of resources that consumers have available to them to spend. Um, but to another, to another degree, it's shifting the resources between where consumers spend, moving them from um, outlets that may not be open any longer because of bankruptcy, may not be open any longer because of governmental orders um, against you know face-to-face -face retailing and moving them to where people are able to spend their money in places like Amazon. Um, and so, you know, is it changing buying habits to some extent? I think it's fair to say that it has already changed buying habits. Um, to some extent, those things will be long-term effects on buying habits simply because consumers have fewer options because there will be so many businesses going under because of this, brick and mortar retailers. Um, and to some extent, because of the uncertainty of how long this is gonna go on, um, how long there's going to need to be some kinds of restrictions in place preventing consumers from uh, doing their normal things, um, shopping out in the world. So it'll be important to watch and, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if this becomes a longer term trend and if e-commerce really picks up the slack um, under these really different sets of circumstances. The last few things that I want to look at in terms of what's going on with consumers here and some of the numbers that we found are, are changes in spending. Um, these are again results of the survey that we took in May and then again in August, September. And we asked consumers um, to categorize if they were spending somewhat or much less on certain things. Um, and then somewhat or much more on those same things so that we could compare the changes in consumers' attitudes about where they were spending their money during the pandemic um, and, and where they were spending less money during the pandemic. And so we asked about household items, and these now mean cleaning products, the kinds of things, disinfectants and so forth, um, that, that briefly became the, the object of hoarding by a lot of consumers. Um, we asked if they were spending somewhat or much less, only 9% in May, 9% in September said that they were spending somewhat or much less on those things. Contrast that with the number that said they were spending somewhat or much more. It was 56% in May, uh, down in September to 44%, so that means more people are funneling into about the same amount um, that they were spending pre-pandemic, but that's still a, a significant um, amount of respondents that say they're still spending somewhat or much more on these kinds of household cleaning items, toilet paper, paper towel, cleaning products, and so forth. Um, health and personal care items, such as hair products. Um, in May and September, only 15 and 14% said they were spending less. In those two periods, 37% said they were spending somewhat or much more on health and personal care items um, down a little bit, so it's normalized a little bit, but still 26% say they're spending somewhat or much more on these things. Um, remember, in a lot of states, we still have hair salons that are closed, so people are coloring their hair at home, styling their hair at home, um, and those kinds of things become necessary in a pandemic, and so it's shifting where consumers are spending. And then, of course, the big one, food and beverage at home. Only 9% in May said they were spending less on food and beverage at home, 9% in September. 62% said they were spending somewhat or much more in May on food and beverage items at home. 
51% in September. So it's come down a little bit, but still more than half of the respondents say that they're spending somewhat or much more on food and beverage items at home than prior to the pandemic. So I think we're seeing some stabilization in these numbers, but you still see that many consumers are still spending much more on household items, food and beverage at home, and those kinds of things um, because of these conditions. Moving on to some other interesting categories and comparing the, these spending attitudes. Um, in May, 47% of respondents said they were spending somewhat or much less on bars and restaurants. That number has actually increased to 57% in September. So interestingly, even though virtually everything was shut down in March, April, and May entirely throughout much of the country, now in September, we're seeing more, a larger percentage of the respondents saying they're spending somewhat or much less on bars and restaurants. Um, so this looks to be a really sort of enduring feature. Um, you notice also that in May, 31% said they were spending more. So we actually had some people that during at the peak of the pandemic said they were spending more on bars and restaurants. That number two is down to 21% in September. Obviously, bars and restaurants are a huge employer in the country, employing millions of people between um, the serving staff and, and the preparation staff and all of the people involved in the running of those things. And this is gonna, this could, you know, very conceivably have a long-term impact um, on the industry as a whole, but on all of those workers within the industry who are also consumers. And so this is, is I think, an important category to keep an eye on and one that, um, we have to hope as soon as the pandemic begins to ease, um, either through a vaccine or in some other way, that that consumers turn their dollars back to these places quickly. Um, if that continued fear um, exists about going into those locations for fear of getting the virus, it may be a really difficult time for bars and restaurants, not just over the next few months, but over the next few years. Um, clothing and apparel is another one where people seem to be sort of changing their behaviors. Um, people were spending much less on clothing and apparel in May, 46% um, were, and now that number's up to 50%. So it seems that people are sort of getting in, in a rut where they're spending just much less on clothing and apparel than they were prior to the pandemic. Um, my own personal theory is that a lot of people simply aren't going out of the house as much, and so they don't need new clothing to go out of the house. A couple of the menswear stores, for instance, have gone out of business because men have bought, stopped buying suits. I'm sure the behavior is similar uh, for women, uh, but if you're not going out into a professional environment where you need that kind of clothing as much as you used to, you're going to buy less of that stuff. And so I think we're seeing the impact there, uh, and it may be a longer term kind of impact as a lot of businesses pivot to work from home models that they plan to implement over a longer period of time. And then just a couple few additional spending categories, and none of these I think will come as a surprise. We've seen really significant decreases in terms of the amount consumers say they're spending on travel and leisure. Uh, it was 60% somewhat or much less in May, 61% in September. Same for entertainment and events, and this encompasses live events, concerts, all of those kinds of things, movie theaters. 56% spending less in May, 63% in September. And then luxury goods and services. Um, and these are higher end items that, that consumers will buy. 49% were spending less in May, up to 53% spending less in September. And so once again, I think you're seeing sort of a troubling situation here where consumers are moving away from spending on certain categories and probably won't move back act to spending in those categories until um, one way or another there's sort of a return to normalcy in terms of the pandemic and the impact that it's had on society. And so just a, a couple of slides left and I wanna go through what has been the impact of all of this? What is all of this doing to the economy? Um, I include this chart, I'm sure many or most of you have seen these numbers, but we saw the real impact of a pandemic of a massive disruption in society in the second quarter here in the United States. And this looks at consumer spending back the last 50 years. Um, and you see, you know, some big downturns in the late 1970s and early 1980s, some big upturns. Um, and by the way, these are quarterly changes and these numbers are always annualized for comparisons on an annual basis. Um, 
but what we saw in Q2 of this year um, was astounding. It was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Consumer spending declined on an annualized basis 34.1% in the second quarter of this year. Consumers just stopped spending and they stopped spending all at once. Um, and this really reflects changes that happened in April more than anything else. May and June um, were actually slow recovery quarters, but everyone stayed home in April. April, everyone stopped spending money in April. A lot of it was because of the economic situation, um, really troubling economic situation, impacting a large number of employees in this country whose jobs simply vanished um, or who couldn't go into work because the economy was closed down in, in that sector. Um, and so really a, a remarkable decline in consumer spending. I wanna contrast this with what has happened to the stock market since all of this happened. Obviously, we had a huge decline in late March and, and into April to some extent in the stock market, one of the most rapid and dramatic declines in the stock market over that month long period. But since then, the market has recovered and it actually hit a new peak in late August. Um, I say, have the markets gone mad? Um, we still have consumers that are spending much less than they did prior to the pan pandemic. We still have whole sectors of the economy, uh, travel for instance, that are more or less shut down. Um, consumers are spending less on luxury goods. Consumers are spending less on all manner of goods and services, um, either because they can't spend in those categories or because the fear um, is still with them and, and the implications of a pandemic are with them. And so they don't wanna spend. Um, so what is the stock market doing? Why would the stock market hit a new peak? And I think a lot of this sort of in conclusion brings us back to what the market is expecting and what I think is our best set of takeaways from all of this data. Um, the markets are expecting consumers to return to their behaviors from prior to the pandemic sooner rather than later. Um, those of you that follow the market will notice that, that we've had a couple of days over the past few months where the market was up a percent or two just on the basis of positive news about a vaccine. Um, the idea here is that the markets have sort of, of um, valued in the implications of the pandemic and now they're expecting the reverse to happen. Where will that money come from? Um, the consumer savings rate hit record levels in April and May of this year, all-time record levels since, since record keeping began. Consumers saved trillions of dollars. Uh, Americans are not known as savers. They don't save money, they spend money, and in fact, a couple of times over the past two decades, Decades, the savings rate was actually negative in the United States, meaning that people were taking out more debt than they were saving money. So there is a huge pile of resources out there available to consumers. Um, this is what we call pent-up demand, and eventually that pent-up demand is going to be let loose in the economy. Um, and so assuming that the pandemic begins to wane soon, assuming that there is a vaccine um, ready for release and that's announced by the end of the year, early next year. Um, the employment situation continues to improve. Consumer fear continues to decline as it has since April. There's really gonna be this huge reservoir of pent up demand among consumers and they'll have the resources or many of them at least will have the resources available to spend because they have been saving at record levels. Um, this is what I would expect to see, um, that all of that consumer demand comes out at once and consumers um, tend to go back to their pre-pandemic behaviors um, as quickly as they're able to, as quickly as the, the conditions around them in terms of the pandemic and the virus allow them to do so. And I think this is um, what we're most likely to see in the near future. So with that, I will end the presentation. I hit, think I hit it exactly on time. I've been monitoring myself. Um, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that you might have. Hopefully they're not too hard. Um, and we will, um, I thank you all for attending. I, I'm, and thank you to Mar uh, Marcy too for um, hosting this. It's really a wonderful venue. So thank oh, you. You're welcome. And thank you for coming. I saved all the hard questions for you. So we'll start with those first and work our way to the easy ones. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> so the first couple of questions are from your first section on working from home and the emotions related to that. So you mentioned in September that 57% of respondents were still working from home. We saw a similar thing with the informal poll we just did, where 66% of people were working from home 100% of the time, people on this call. Great. Um, do you see this? Yeah. Do you see this trend continuing after the pandemic is over? Or do you think this is the end of the office environment as we know it? Yeah, I, I think for a lot of industries, that's precisely what's going to happen. And several large national companies have already announced that they're just not going to reopen their headquarters, or at least not in the format that they've had them before. And they're going to continue to uh, permit employees to work from home or those that want to, to do so. Um, this is obviously going to have a big impact on the retail, um, retail, commercial retail um, space here in the United States. But I think it's a model that a lot of businesses um, are going to adopt. And this has been an interesting uh, case study in whether or not that's going to work. I, I think, amazingly, so many industries that had never allowed employees to work remotely before all of a sudden realize that it can be done and that they can actually save a lot of money by doing so um, in terms of less office space and all, all that goes with that in terms of overhead costs. So it may very well be the kind of thing that keeps up. Now, on the other hand, and I, some of this is anecdotal um, in conversations with other professionals, but a lot of people want to get back out of the house again and go back into an office. I've heard people that I know didn't used to enjoy going to the office, say, I would give anything to just be able to go into the office one or two days a week and have that, you know, social experience again. I mean, it is sort of a social experience. So I think some employees will long for that and some businesses will um, decide that it's still a really important part of what they do to have that kind of interaction between the employees in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, but I think it's, it's safe to say that you're gonna see more people working from home part-time or fully um, for the long term than before the pandemic. And your slide related to that mentioned that in September the same month, 47% of respondents feared that they would die from COVID-19. Science suggests that despite vaccines being available early 2021, COVID could be with us for a long time. How do you see this altering behavior? It is. I mean, it's a really interesting question, and there's a lot of fear out there. Um, a lot of reason to, to, to sort of be afraid, obviously, um, you know, but, but people are, it has really impacted people and it's going to impact them over the long run. And, and obviously the most vulnerable populations to this virus are probably going to be more impacted than the others in terms of how they respond to this. Um, they're, they're probably going to change behaviors over the long term. And when you hear, like we have over the last couple of days, that that um, I just saw an unrelated statistic that um, people that have tested positive over the past couple of months were more than twice as likely to have visited a restaurant than people who were testing negative. Um, it's going to turn people off of those experiences. It's going to make people, again, particularly in the at-risk groups or the more at-risk groups, it's going to make them hesitant uh, and fearful over the long term. And so I think you'll see at least segments of the consumer population changing their behaviors, not just now, but, but over the long term. Even with vaccines, of course, even with effective treatments for these things, um, there's still risk. And, and this is simply how viruses work. And so I think it's probably going to change behaviors over the long term for those populations at least. And let's spend some time on the spending survey. Just a, a quicker question on, uh, from Kevin on the sample size. So on the study itself, did you, can you provide any kind of description on the demographics? Um, he's yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't run all the demographics for the second wave yet, although we went in and, and we interviewed the same people. It's about it's a little more than a thousand respondents that we have in here. Um, it was an online survey that we did. Um, the waves, again, were the same respondents. And the first wave was um, very similar to census demographics for the United States. So the idea was we wanted to get a cross-section of the American consumer population. And so it looks very much like America. Um, 
we did have some respondents in there and I was when I saw that, that the number was only 95% um, of people that were under government lockdown and I was at the time thinking well shouldn't it be a hundred percent but there were actually a couple of states in there in um, late April early May that had already opened back up and these respondents were from those states so um, we, we look like we got a sample that, that really fits with the, the demographics of the United States. Um, fairly evenly distributed, a few more women than men in there, um, distributed across racial and ethnic groups, uh, income groups, and so forth. So again, our goal was to get a sample that looked like the American consumer population as much as we could, and we seem to have hit that. And let's dig into that survey. So we have questions, I think, from every sector, from someone representing every sector. So let's start with shopping okay. online. Um, we saw the trend that it increased and now it's slowly decreasing, but just slightly. If COVID-19 continues to be a threat, how do you see that impacting high streets and malls? That's a really tough one. And obviously it's, it's you know, a, a sector of the economy that, that's in real trouble. Um, Malls especially have taken a big hit, um, not just the stores within the malls, but the owners of the malls as well um, have actually had to come in and rescue a couple of stores that they need to have in those malls to keep the malls open, to keep the, the foot traffic up. Um, you know, if consumer, of course, let, let's pause here for a minute too. Um, malls were already in trouble and brick and mortar retailers were already in trouble long before this pandemic began because of the advent of online shopping and all of the the consumer dollars that had moved over from traditional retail outlets to places like Amazon and eBay and so forth. Um, these places were already in some trouble. This has accelerated a process that, that began um, sometime around the year 2000, honestly, about 20 years ago. But this has really accelerated that trend. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of different perspectives, and, and this is me as an academic trying to hedge my bets here a little bit, but um, the two perspectives are that this accelerated something that started long ago and it will continue to accelerate. Um, that you're gonna see more and more of these large traditional brick and mortar retailers and even entire malls shut down because they simply don't have the traffic. Um, um, and they lost too much money during the pandemic to justify remaining open. The other outcome that I could easily see come to pass here is that when all of this is over, if it's over through a vaccine or, or if, you know, ultimately pandemics have ended historically when people just say, I've had enough staying home and, and I'm not going to do it anymore, whether the virus is still out there or not. This one we're hoping ends with a, an effective vaccine. Um, but when that does end, there, there's also the, the possibility that consumers say, I'm going to the mall. I haven't been out of the house in you know, six months, eight months, 10 months, or I haven't been to a, a retail shopping location in that long. Um, I'm gonna do something I didn't used to do and I'm gonna go to the mall. I'm gonna walk around the mall and shop there because they have not been, you know, it's sort of the, the forbidden fruit phenomenon. They haven't been able to or allowed to do that. And now the urge to do things, even if they weren't normally doing those things before the pandemic, the urge is strong and they go out and they do those behaviors. That probably wouldn't be a long-term consequence. I don't see a lot of people, I don't see myself, for instance, becoming a frequent mall shopper. I wasn't before the pandemic and I can't imagine myself spending eight hours on a Saturday wandering through the mall now. Uh, but you could see sort of at least a short to midterm reversal for some of those things as everything opens back up and consumers can do what they've been forbidden for doing. And on the flip side of that, there's a question from Steve who's mentioning the backlog of available merchandise in stores like Home Depot or other um, home goods stores, Ikea, Target. Um, how do you anticipate consumers tolerating the absence of goods with, with their opportunity to spend? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think in some cases, consumers have tried to be a little bit more more patient, recognizing that, that certain goods were gonna be in high demand. Um, I think a lot of that patience has worn off of consumers. They're, they're not really interested in being patient anymore. Um, you know, why isn't this stuff in the store yet? Why can't I buy the stuff that I wanna buy? Why are my Amazon orders slower? Why, why is my mail coming slower than it used to? I think consumers are sort of getting to that point where they understand that we're in you know unique circumstances and that businesses are in unique circumstances, but as time goes on, the anticipation is that things will return to normal and they want to get the service experience that they used to get from those stores more and more. 
Um, I would expect that to continue too, that consumers start, okay, it's time for things to go back to normal now. Um, you know, it's time for me to be able to buy something that I want right away. It's time for me to get my one day shipment from Amazon. It's time for me to be able to go into a Home Depot and get exactly what I want and not have to um, wait for a back order of that thing. All of those things, you know, and that, you know, as, as Michigan State University just announced number one supply chain program, a lot of that depends on the supply chain too. Um, you know, keeping the economy open enough so that workers throughout that supply chain can get these products to consumers when they want them is, is part of the problem. Um, and so it's really gonna depend on, on, you know, how quickly we can open things back up, but I don't think consumers um, are in the mood anymore to be as patient as they were when this all first began. Yeah, agreed. Are there any differences between the way shopping is taking place for rural versus urban households? I haven't actually looked at that data so that I, I, I couldn't really give you an answer. I know a lot of the rural areas and, and I focused on Michigan um, in looking at some of this, you know, just through, through research I'm doing in other areas, but a lot of the rural areas in, in states like Michigan um, have been less impacted by the virus, both practically in terms of, you know, the caseload, the number of cases that they've had, but also in terms of how they're responding to that and how they're behaving. Um, you know, and I, I, we've seen parts of Michigan where life has changed only slightly in the less populated, more rural areas of Michigan um, than what it was like before the pandemic. Um, I would expect that you've probably seen less of an impact than you have on, on urban areas that were entirely shut down for months and months. Um, but I don't really have any data on that, so I wouldn't want to say that too definitively. So there's several, like I mentioned, there's people representing several industries here. Can you speak to the trends that you see or foresee in real estate, higher ed, consulting, coaching? Whoa. <laughs> Yes, that would be the hardest question. Then I'll make it easy from there. Real estate's a weird one. And as we've seen, those, those of you that, that obviously we have an industry representative here, real estate's doing surprisingly well. Non-commercial real estate. So the house mar housing market has actually done really well. Um, you know, it, it, it hasn't suffered as much as, as you might think. Commercial real estate's another matter, particularly retail. Um, commercial real estate uh, is, is probably going to hurt from this for some time. Um, you know, and, and we see all the, the big businesses that have gone bankrupt, but of course the small and mid-sized businesses are, are going to have a really devastating impact on, on, on commercial retail um, over the longer term, one would think. Um, higher education, wow, what a change all of the schools have had to go through. Um, there's another example, I think, where you see um, a lot of the consumers basically saying our patience is up. Um, if I'm going to spend what I need to spend to send my child to a four-year university, I want them to be on campus. Some universities simply haven't opened it up to that, even with demands from those parents out of safety concerns for the students and for the consumers of the higher education product. But you're seeing, you know, backlash uh, about that and, and sort of pushing in both directions. Um, but again, I think you're starting to see in a lot of these kinds of industries, consumers that are, um, you know, as with higher ed and a lot of other industries, that they are really hoping for things to be normalized sooner rather than later. And that's, you know, that's the, the, the old way of doing things is what they want to spend their dollars on. What were some of the other categories? Uh, consulting, coaching, and if I can add a couple, uh, subscription services like streaming, travel, Streaming has done wonderfully, of course, right? Everyone has, has um, multiple streaming services now. I was a, just a Netflix user before all this began, and I have Netflix, Amazon Prime, Peacock, I think two or three others, because I just said, well, if I'm going to be stuck in the house, I'm going to have every possible television viewing option that exists on Earth. Um, and that's how a lot of, of, of consumers have been, of course. And so those businesses have done quite well. Consulting, as, as a former consultant myself, I can tell you, um, you know, travel is gone, right? I, I did a lot of, in, in my, my earlier career, in my consulting career, did a lot of travel myself, and, and it was international travel. And that's all gone. I mean, the, those, those, you know, for the most part, those, those kinds of um, expenses by companies either on the client side or on the supplier side have just dried up. 
because of everything that's going on and businesses don't want to risk sending their employees to a potential hotspot for the virus and so forth. Um, one wonders if that's going to become more of a less of a face to face kind of business than it used to be. And a lot of this consulting will be done remotely, just like a lot of other jobs are going to. Um, coaching, I don't know if I can say anything intelligent about that, but you know, again, the same kind of thing that a lot of these things that were traditionally industries that had a face-to-face -face dimension and component and were considered important to it, they're getting pressure to go back to normal and you have countervailing pressures that we can't do that yet because of everything that's going on. Um, Long-term effects are really hard to speculate on some of those things. Mm -hmm. That was a very, very broad question. Yeah. So thank you for tackling that one. Okay. <laughs> These will be more specific. There are okay. two questions. Um, one of them is on B2B spending. So I know that's not your area of research that you presented here today. In some ways, it's impacted by what you presented. Sure. Um, what insight do you have on, on how B2B purchasing will respond going forward? I mean, that's really going to depend on what kind of B2B purchasing we're talking about, right? I mean, if, if the end consumer are ordinary consumers or not is, is going to have a big impact on that. Um, and this gets back to the idea of, of all of this relating back to the, the full supply chain um before these products or services reach the end consumer um but you know without those end consumers out there and without the something like 14 trillion dollars that those consumers spend in the u.s economy every year it's really difficult to see some of these industries get back to their normal um b2b kind of spending levels because they simply don't have the end consumer there um to offer a product to that want to buy that product um, and so it really is sort of a ripple effect. It starts with the individual consumer and buyer. You take all of those, you know, 14 or 15 trillion dollars in the aggregate those consumers put into the economy each year, take out even a quarter of that over a longer period of time. And we saw a bigger drop than that in second quarter. That's, that's going to have a huge ripple effect throughout the economy and not just the U.S. economy, but of course, the, the global economy as well. Um, so, you know, once we can get those consumers back into to their normal spending habits, the sooner the better in terms of how that impacts the entire economy. Okay, thank you. You know, that was a business to business question that I asked you, and I know this is a presentation focused on consumer okay. spending, but I also knew you'd have some insights on that. So I have three more questions for you. Okay. Uh, the first is about supply chain. You have mentioned that. This question is from Deanna. Deanna. She is a consumer and a professional working in supply chain okay. and finds it interesting that inventories of manufactured goods are not coming back. Building materials are skyrocketing in price if, if you can find them and products like personal ORVs are almost unavailable. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think companies are holding back to keep prices high? I don't know if they're holding back to keep prices high or if there's just a great deal of uncertainty about when everything gets back to normal. Um, it's really easy for us as consumers or as, as sort of professionals and consultants looking in from the outside. Sounds like she's an insider, but um, you know, us looking from the outside well, just make more of this stuff, right? S stop holding back on production, start making more of this stuff. Why isn't there paper towel in the supermarket again? We're six months into the pandemic. The paper towel manufacturers should um, have have adjusted their production and 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 made it easier for us to get these products at relatively normal prices. Um, I think the reality, though, is is that so many manufacturers and even service providers are so uncertain about what's happening and so in the dark about how to adjust their models of production, for instance, that they can't, that they're still a little bit behind, you know, behind here on, on getting all of this ready and out into the marketplace. Um, until, you know, I hate to go back to this, but until we have something like a vaccine or, you know, a really effective treatment that makes everyone feel like things are going to be normal again from now on, or at least because of this, this pandemic, things are going to go back to normal um, in terms of the mindset of consumers, the mindset of businesses. I think you're, you're going to see some of these strange disruptions um, in production, strange disruptions of what you can and cannot get out there in the world as a consumer. And that that's probably going to keep up until, you know, that, that, you know, knock on wood, let's hope very soon miracle moment when they announce that they have an effective vaccine um, 
then I think you see everything change. I think you see businesses get right back into their production models, maybe even ramp up production from where they were prior to the pandemic, because there's going to be a lot of consumer demand for stuff, especially, especially experiences. You're going to see a lot of people um, that want to go on a plane again, that want to travel to a foreign country, that want to go to a concert, go to the movie theater, do those kinds of things. Um, so you've seen a steep decline and, you know, you should, if all goes well, once that announcement is made, you should see the reverse, a huge dramatic increase where everything does start to go back to normal. So I have two last questions. We have many industries represented here. The last two questions are about universities and okay. government. So David asks, do we see university boards reassessing the fixed capital asset expansion and possibly seeking alternate uses of assets as education starts to move to remote full or part-time? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> it's a great question, David. And it's an important question, of course, right? Because um, universities spend billions and billions of dollars on, on um, big capital projects like that. Um, how this impacts that over the long term, one would think there has to be an impact because this this pandemic has hit so many people personally and and so many sectors of the economy um, dramatically and tragically, but but universities as well, obviously, and right here at Michigan State as well. Um, do universities reassess what they're spending their money on? I think they'll have to. How that plays out in regards to the different ways that they spend their money, I am completely in the dark and I have no idea, but I, the, uh, there's going to be an impact, I have no doubt. And for government, have you seen or do you have any insights into near or midterm government spending and how that might change as a result of the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, well, there, there's another question and this time I can say I don't have a good answer to it because no one has a good answer to it. A lot of that's going to depend on the elections in November course, what the government does in terms of spending. Um, and we could see a couple of really dramatically different outcomes based on the outcomes of the uh, outcome of the election um, in terms of does the government really ramp up things like testing and deployment of the vaccine and all of those other kinds of things? Um, or does it, you know, take a more hands-off approach and, and, and let the pandemic run its course? Um, you know, that's really going to depend on what happens, you know, in 48 days from now or whenever the election is um, quite soon. Um, and you could see a really dramatically different outcomes based on, on the outcome of the election. And the last thought, a future thought uh, that I want to address with this question. You mentioned that when the pandemic wanes, consumer fear declines even more employment improves that we'll see a substantial spend due to pent up demand. Can you describe what that might look like? Uh, it could like, look like not quite the exact opposite of the drop that we saw in the second quarter, um, but close to it. I mean, you, you could see, um, the re and the reason I say it won't be quite as steep is because people did go back to spending to some extent in May and June. Both, uh, both of those months were up in terms of spending. It was really just April that was so dramatically low that it pulled the entire quarter down. Um, but it's very conceivable to me. For instance, I've been, uh, interestingly, I've been watching a lot of the, uh, the cruise line stocks. Um, and those hit, you know, 30 year lows when all of this um, started and all the cruise ships had outbreaks and all got shut down and are still shut down and all of those things. Um, but the stock prices have actually started to rebound over the past couple of months, which I find really interesting. The idea being is that the market anticipates that when people are able to take that experience again and buy it, they're gonna do it and they're gonna probably do it in record numbers. Um, so, so once the vaccine gets gets approved, gets to the, the stage three trials, gets approved, and then there's dates for deployment on a broad scale, and this is hundreds of millions of people just in the United States, um, and possibly multiple um, doses of the vaccine. Once those dates are announced, I would expect people to start going crazy and spending um, spending like crazy. Again, I don't expect a 34% increase in GDP that quarter um, because there has already been some rebound, but 
a substantial, maybe double digit increase in both consumer spending and gross domestic product is, is not impossible. Boy, that's going to be great when we're finally living through those times. <laughs> So we have made it through our questions for today. I wanted to save about two minutes for you to share any final thoughts with our audience today. Oh, I, you know, I think this is a really interesting topic. I think, um, you know, all of the, the sadness notwithstanding about having to go through something like this. And um, as a parent, I can tell you, it's been really difficult with kids, you know, getting them to understand why they're not getting to go to in-person schooling for their junior or senior year of high school. Um, but it is a really interesting time to, to observe what's going on in the marketplace and to try to better understand what consumers are gonna do as a consequence of this. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see if what I anticipate happening, which I, which I just said that we're gonna see, you know, all of that sort of pent up consumer demand come out at once, if that does happen. Um, you know, if for whatever reason, again, knock on wood, it, it, we don't get the, the, the treatment or the vaccine options um, come to fruition here over the next couple of months, this could drag out for a, a longer period of time. And um, then there really will be a new normal. Um, it will be a really different consumer landscape um, over a longer period of time. Um, but short of that, I would expect that there, you know, should there be positive developments on the vaccine front and the treatment front that will get consumers getting out there into the marketplace as quickly and robustly as they can soon. And um, those of you in industries that have been struggling, I wish you all the best. I hope all industries are rebounding and, um, you know, the, the country is, is sort of getting on the mend in a couple of ways here over the next few months. Thank you for sharing this research with us. You have some really interesting, thought-provoking statistics to dig into and think about how they apply to, you know, consumers and the other industries. And thank you for taking those very broad questions from uh, the other industries that we represent here. I appreciate here. the questions from the audience. That was great. <laughs> so for those of you that are watching, we just have two of these left. The time has flown by and we have really enjoyed doing this with you and for you. So we are considering, you know, how we can stay connected to you as we move forward with many different things at MSU. Uh, because we do want to continue working with you each week, you know, into the future. So there's two more of these left and then several opportunities that we've mentioned to you as well. So we hope to see that some of those are advantageous to you. Um, so until next week, uh, we wish you well. Take care. <laughs>